Hi. In this video, we'll talk about three different ways that cells repair damaged DNA. Base excision repair, nucleotide excision repair, and double strand break repair. Method one, base excision repair. This occurs when a single base is affected. In the case shown here, it is a type of damage called deamination. This is when a C base has an amino group that gets deaminated, leaving a carbonyl group in its place. And coincidentally, when this happens, the result is the base of cytosine turns into a base of uracil, the base that is normally in RNA. Now you will remember that uracil acts the same and base pairs the same as a T. And so this seems to DNA like a C to T mutation. But the cell also knows that there should be no uracil in DNA. In fact, there are special enzymes called uracil DNA glycosylase that will scan the genome for places where a U is present. When it finds it, it will excise it, cut out the base, and then cut out the corresponding backbone groups, a sugar and a phosphate group. Then DNA polymerase will come along and insert the correct base, a C, to base pair with a G, and then the enzyme DNA ligase will seal the NIC. There's a very similar type of DNA damage called depurination, which happens to purines, which are Gs or As. This class of mutations cleave the bond between the sugar and the base, and the bases will be lost. So those types of mutations or DNA errors will use this repair mechanism as well. These are both two very kinds, common kinds of mutations, and they are repaired effectively by the cell, but not perfectly. Historically, we can actually see that evolutionarily, there are more C to T mutations than other types of base pair changes. So again, it's a very commonly occurring event, and the cell catches the vast majority, but not all of them. A second type of DNA repair method is called nucleotide excision repair. In this case, two or more bases can be affected, and the type of damage shown here is a pyrimidine dimer, which is a more generic term for the type of damage we saw in the previous video, thymine dimers. So this is a pyrimidine dimer. Instead of a TNT with thymine dimer, we have a CT base pair, which can also form this dimer. And once again, there are proteins which constantly scan and surveil the genome. When it finds this kind of an error, it will cleave the backbone at some distance from the lesion site, remove the entire piece of DNA using the enzyme DNA helicase, and DNA polymerase will fill in the template from 3' to 5', prime, and the ligase will seal the NIC final NIC. So again, this is an efficient mechanism for repairing thymine dimers. Before we get to the third mechanism of repair, we're going to ask the question, when the cell encounters a mutation drawn mostly as a bubble, how does it know which strand to repair? This picture is not very realistic, because really the bubble is on both sides. This picture implies that the correct base is straight and has a normal backbone, and the incorrect base bubbles out a bit, but in reality, both sides will be affected. In this case, you have a C to an A mutation. After replication, a T will be inserted next to the A, and a C will properly be inserted next to the G. And going on, you would have 50% mutated cells and 50% non-mutated cells. Now let's, now let's look at what happens if the cell knows somehow that the A is the incorrect base, although we don't know how it does that yet. It can correct the A, and then it can put two Gs there, and now you'll have 100% correct cells of the progeny, which will all have the correct genome. But think about the consequences if the incorrect base is repaired. If the G is cut out and it gets converted to a T, now you have 100% of the progeny cells having the mutation incorporated. So how does the cell figure out which is the proper base to go at that position? The answer is quite ingenious, and what the cell does, which gets it right most of the time, but not every time, is it will, once it finds a mismatch, it will scan along the genome in both directions, looking for the closest nick in the backbone of the strand. The cell then assumes that this is the most recently synthesized strand, the other strand with no nicks having stood the test of time, per se. And so it will decide to cut out the mutated region of the DNA that's on the strand that has the closest pre-existing NIC. And it will repair that with a polymerase and then a ligase sealing the final NIC. As you might guess, this all happens relatively quickly right after DNA synthesis. 
It has to be quick because if a different enzyme happens to notice there's a nick present in the DNA, it will repair this, the nick. Now the cell will not know which is the newly synthesized strand. So after synthesis, the DNA is basically a ticking time bomb where the cell ha has to repair this bulge before another enzyme fixes this remote nick if it's going to use this mechanism for pricking out which strand to repair. Now the third DNA repair mechanism that we'll study is a mechanism called homologous recombination. And this is a way that cells repair, most of the time, the most serious of DNA lesions, double strand breaks. When both strands are mutated or damaged, the cell needs to repair both strands, not just one. One crude brute force method shown here on the left is non-homologous end joining. When a double strand break is identified, if it cannot use homologous recombination, the cell will just cut back the ends of the DNA to make them blunt or even, and then just jam the two ends together. You have deleted DNA base pairs in this method, which for a protein could be quite dis disastrous. Losing even a single base will change the reading frame, which can then change every subsequent amino acid. And while that's better than having a broken chromosome, non-homologous end joining is a last resort. A preferred method, which we'll talk about, is homologous recombination. And what's important to remember is that you have two copies of every chromosome. You have one chromosome from your father and one from chromosome from your mother. And what the cell will do is use the other chromosome to guide the repair. It will cut away the affected region. It will use as a template the other chromosome, and it will synthesize new DNA. So it will change your genetic material, replacing, for instance, your copy of your dad's gene with your mother's version. So now you will have two copies of the maternal version. Hopefully it won't, but hopefully it won't incorporate a deleterious mutation. And this is a far preferable alternative to simply jamming the two ends back together. This is the molecular mechanism for homologous recombination. In this example, we have a double strand break. First, the cell uses an exonuclease to chew back from the breaks in the five prime direction. The purpose is to create a segment of the DNA which is single stranded and then available for base pairing. Miraculously, miraculously the single-stranded section aligns with the other parental chromosome and now is part of a double helix there. This is called a D-loop. And it can go on synthesizing in the normal 5' prime to 3' prime direction, where the bulge of the other strand of the paternal chromosome is being successively displaced until it has traveled some distance. Now it has enough material to reach the existing maternal chromosome, and then the ligase can seal the nick. At the same time, the existing part of the strand can now be used as a template for the synthesis of the other strand. And again, the lig ligase will seal the neck here. So overall, this is pretty amazing. One of the ways that double strand breaks occur is through ionizing radiation, like x-rays or cosmic rays. But a lot of us don't get exposed to x-rays that often. But a common way that double strand breaks form is when a replication fork encounters a nick in the backbone. If you have a leading strand synthesis and you encounter a nick, that's it. You're done. There's no further extending because you no longer have a complete strand that is in its proximity as a template. The cell will begin homologous recombination by using the exonuclease activity in the 5' prime direction and having a strand that can base pair to the other chromosome and start the repair process. We will encounter homologous recombination later in the course when we're studying meiosis. As you already know, you inherit one chromosome from your father and one chromosome from your mother. But the chromosomes that you will pass on to your offspring are not purely either your paternal or your maternal chromosome, but a combination chromosome that is unique to you. You might be wondering, how is it that in some cases, homologous recombination can exchange genetic material versus sometimes simply repairing a damaged segment? So we'll spend just a few minutes dissecting the mechanism. The key to this is to focus on this particular intermediate called a holiday junction. That's a rather famous term. And the difference is how these crossover intermediates get resolved. If we cleave the chiasma or crossover this way, you will have an exchange of genetic material. If you cleave this intermediate that way, you will have a repaired chromosome. 
It's impossible to phys fully visualize here, but let me try to make it a little clearer. On the left is the form that was shown on the previous slide. On the right is the same molecule, but it's unwound in this direction. And now we have an open form. And I think you can see here, if you cleave it this way, that in one case you'll have repaired material. Or in this case, if you cleave it here, you'll have translocation with some of the paternal and maternal material mixed. And this is made even clearer here on this slide. Cut it vertically and you have double strand break repair. Cut it horizontally and you have crossing over as in meiosis. Okay, this is a bit challenging to visualize, but work through it. And I think you will be able to see the molecular difference. So that concludes the video on three different types of DNA repair. Base excision repair, nucleotide excision repair, and homologous recombination. Thanks for listening.